We have a grandstand seat on all these kind of horrible tragedies. We're taken into the confidence of some people, whilst in this case, for example, the Moreland mur murder oh. hunt, uh, many people are saying, what is behind it? Newspaper men know from the beginning what's behind it, so therefore they're, they're woven into the pattern and they don't even tell their own families because some of the details are so gruesome. Well, Angan's too good for them. Well, it is, it's too quick. It is, they want to torture too them. Quick. A tooth for a tooth. And a life for a life. They should take a life for a life. That is, providing they've done it, which we don't know yet. But they ought to let Mr Downey do what he wants to, and they ought to give them people to the people that have found those children. That's Mr Downey. Let him go and get him. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Good. The crimes of Myra Hindley and Ian Brady shocked the nation. Myra was once known as the most evil woman in Britain. With her partner Ian Brady, she took part in the abduction, sexual abuse, torture and murder of five innocent children. They would both go on to be sentenced with life imprisonment. Many argued that without Brady, Myra Hindley would not have gone on to do these vile acts by participating, cooperating and planning such heinous crimes. Myra had had a fairly normal childhood, but met Ian Brady, which led her to transform into Evil Reborn. As of right now, both Myra and Ian are dead. Myra Hindley died on the 15th of November 2002 after serving 36 years at the age of 60. She died from pneumonia. Ian Brady died on May 15th 2017 after serving 51 years. He died from heart disease and other health problems at the age of 79. Myra was born on the 23rd of July 1942 in Manchester, England. Her father was an alcoholic who was violent towards the family. She had a sister named Maureen, who was four years younger. There was once an incident where a boy her age scratched her cheek, which drew blood. When Myra cried to her dad, he threatened to belt her if she did not retaliate and hurt the boy back. Another worthy mention is the drowning of one of her closest friends. At the age of 13, Michael Higgins invited Myra and friends to swim in a local reservoir, but she went elsewhere with another friend. He would go on to drown that day and Myra always blamed herself for his death. With Ian Brady, he was born in Glasgow, Scotland on the 2nd of January 1938. He was born as Ian Duncan Stewart to a single mother who worked as a waitress. 
His father reportedly was a man who worked on a local newspaper and died three months before Ian's birth. Due to having no support for herself, let alone a child, his mother was forced to put him in care. He would then be cared for by Mary and John Sloan, a local couple with four children of their own. Brady would then take the name Ian Sloan, and his mother would visit him throughout his childhood. As a teenager, he twice appeared in juvenile court for housebreaking, which is to enter a home with force. He left school at 15 years old and started working to support himself. He had a girlfriend for a short while, but they broke up after he threatened her with a flick knife because she went to a dance with another boy. At the age of 16, he would have nine charges against his name. Shortly before his 17th birthday, he was on probation and back with his mother. His mother had married an Irishman named Patrick Brady, so for the third time in under 18 years, Ian would go on to have another surname. By the age of 20, he had a new stable job, but was teaching himself German, and he loved the book Mein Kampf, written by Adolf Hitler. He supported the Nazis, and also loved his Tiger Club motorcycle, which he would ride frequently. Brady was Hindley's first lover, and in that, she worshipped him and became obsessed with his evil fantasies and philosophies. She began ignoring family members for Brady, completely cutting them off. She would also engage in very extreme and violent sex with Brady as he did not have an appetite for normal sexual experiences. Brady told Hindley there was no God, so she stopped going to church. He told her about how rape and murder was the ultimate pleasure, and so she believed him. Her personality intertwined with his. He began planning a bank robbery in 1963 and needed a getaway driver. So Myra began driving lessons, shooting lessons, and then bought two guns. It was never carried out, but it helped Brady realize that he had a loyal partner in crime. They acted out their first murder after this. See that woman over there stopped us going in her garden now. Her husband said we were ruining all these flowers, trampling all over the garden. <laughs> well, it was uh, the following morning after my wife left. I came down about uh, half eight. I went to draw the curtains. And uh, to my surprise, as you know what it would be like if you're getting up early in the morning and see your garden filled with all police. We were down here watching telly until it was um, three minutes to midnight. We got the time check. What I heard, <coughs> it was, um, I would say, furniture's moving, you know, when rustling and tugging of feet, I would say. Uh, I know it was a heavy fight, like, you know, and things knocking around, like. And in that time, I heard a voice. Well, the voice had said, um, Myra, Myra, which they, at the time, could be one of the victims. They absolutely worshipped the dog. To them, it was a baby. And at Christmas, she made them all um, a lovely little Christmas present up, properly done up in paper and uh, string with the names on. You sort of don't know what people are. Well, it was just one living up all the time, thinking she'd come home, and I, I was sat with my coat on for about three months, waiting for daylight to come to run out and see if I can fi could find her. I was just crying and crying and thinking about what had happened in my mind. And I kept thinking about it, and I couldn't sleep through thinking about it, and it built up and built up, and I think that's what caused it, my nervous breakdown. I was in hospital, and I remember my husband saying that Pauline had been found. I remember them had two nurses brought me home to the funeral. I remember everything about the funeral, everything.
I, rem I remember following the coffin and she was, she was at the flowers and I remember people putting flowers on, throwing flowers down and I remember putting the dust on Pauline and putting me a flower on. Well, it was as years went on, I was saying my prayers about it and it seemed to lift me like a cloud come, you know, like a cloud lifting off my shoulders and I f began to feel more pleasant about it. Although I never forgot it, I never forgot it any day. Even now, I think about it every day. And the way she had to go, it's never to be forgotten that. Never. Ian Brady and Mari Hindley encountered 16-year-old Pauline Reed on the 12th of July 1963. She was on her way to a dance in a pink party dress. Myra, who knew Pauline, pulled up beside her in a car and asked if she would help look for a glove in the Saddleworth Moor. Pauline, of course, accepted the request from her older family friend. But little did she know that no glove was lost and that Ian Brady was following behind them on his motorcycle. They travelled to the moors to look for the glove. When they arrived, both Myra and Pauline got out. As they were looking for the fictional item, Ian Brady snuck up behind Pauline and beat her to death with a spade, going on to sexually assault her. Myra would act as though she had no idea what happened to Pauline, and the community and family believed her. The children played out and then John tormented his brothers and sisters and I said, please go to the cinema, John. Stop tormenting your brothers and sisters. And don't forget when Pauline Reed was missing, what I told you, whoever did it is only a train ride away from here. So always be on your guard. And he, he just grinned, his cheeky grin and bye, off he went. John spent that Saturday afternoon at the cinema, but instead of going home afterwards, his adventurous spirit took hold. Hey John, just check us all boxes. Okay. He was helping on the market ground, wasn't he? He never thought he was doing anything like that. But he was earning a bit of pocket money. In spite of the warnings, he was too trusting. Especially a lady, because I never warned him about women, you know. There were no, well, I didn't think there were any bad women about. John Kilbride was the eldest of his siblings. He'd always help the local markets pack and unpack their goods, and would always be home for 6pm. When he didn't come home on Saturday evening, at around 6.30pm, his mother phoned the police. Posters of John went far and wide, but no one would report anything. Myra would visit a pub called the Bessemer. There was photos of missing children above the bar, and she would drink there knowing exactly where some of them were. In Hindley's statement, she said she picked up John at Ashton Market and led John to Brady's vehicle. John would later be found buried close to the road with his underwear tied to the bottom of his legs. Like Pauline, he was also sexually assaulted by Brady. The police also found the name John Kilbride in Brady's notebook in Brady's handwriting. This was enough to link them to this murder. Brady also took a photograph of Myra on top of John Kilbride's grave. I actually got ready myself to go and help on the dig and I was uh, more or less locked in my bedroom by my father. A couple of days after the police came with a shoot. My mum identified it as being John's, and they found John's body then. In 
In June 1964, Keith was meant to visit his grandmother but never showed up. He was walking from his house to his grand's. Myra showed up at the top of a path he was taking, with the same glove story given to the previous two victims. Keith's grandma came to his mother's house to ask where Keith was. His mother Winnie asked the same thing of her, and instantly went to the police station to report him missing. Keith's murder was different in the sense they took him deep into the moors, so deep that to this day his body is still undiscovered. Ian will go on to hit Keith in the back of the head, break his neck with a cord, and then sexually assault him. Ian claimed he left his clothes by the side of his grave, but no such grave or clothes have ever been found. Winnie died in 2012 and requested Ian did the right thing and tell them where Keith was before she died. Ian never said a word and took that secret to his grave in 2017. He hit him on the back of the head, knocked him out, and then put a, a machine cord rubber around his neck and broke his neck. And um, he actually assaulted him afterwards and left the clothes at the side where they buried him. He didn't know he was going to his death. Les, it was a typical um, ten-year-old innocent child. She was a loving child. She was a picture. She was an angel. And then Leslie said, um, she would like to go to the fair on uh, Boxing Day. She said she was going with Mrs. Clark and her two children and her children. So we said, are you sure? She said, yeah. So we said, well, that's okay then. So we went to Mill Street Police Station just after five o'clock and we reported it that um, Leslie was on the fair and she hadn't come home, which she said she would be home for five o'clock. So um, he looks at us as if we was daft. Um, he said, look, he said, if I had that many parents come in when the child was missing just an hour or so, he said, we'd be out of our mind, we'll worry. So I said, what to do? He said, go home. And he said, I can assure you that if you went home, she'd be in. She'd be on waiting for you. So that eased us a bit. Went home. No, Leslie. Six months after Keith's murder, Ian Amara would abduct a 10 year old girl named Leslie Ann Downey. But this time, they would take her back to their house. They would go on to record on a tape recorder and record one of the most disturbing audios ever played to a UK courthouse. This tape is what helped condemn Myra Hindley and prove that she was an accomplice and not a victim or bystander. She is heard on the tape telling Leslie to shut up and be quiet, along with expressing concern that the neighbours may hear Leslie crying. Leslie is heard saying, please mum, but Myra went on to tie a gag around her and allow Ian to torture her and assault her. Photos were taken of Leslie in a compromising position, but Myra claimed no sexual abuse took place in front of her. Whilst Myra ran a bath, Ian Brady killed Leslie, and the next day they would bury her in the moors. That's Mr. Downing! I ring 999, I'm put through to Hyde Police Station. I don't tell them over the phone what's happening. Pick me up. My name is David Smith. I'm at Hare Hill Road, phone box. Pick me up, please. We get to the station. All I want to do is smoke. I sit, I can't talk. I can't tell them yet. Your man sits on the edge of the desk, he waits. He knows there's a problem. He waits. In your own time. I say it's murder. 
I've come round because Ian's got some wine bottles he wants to let you have. Would you walk me back home? Yeah, no problem. No problem. So I walk her back home. I go in the house. She takes me into the kitchen. Wait here a minute. And then she goes into the living room. All of a sudden, they're screaming, they're swearing, they banging around. She screams, Dave, Dave, help him. I go running into the living room and Brady's got this lad whacking him and whacking him and hitting him and hitting him with an axe. It's very violent. Very, very violent. The lad is on the floor. Brady's still hitting him. I think he'd received 14 blows. It was very bad. He then strangles him. He's swearing at him, he's cursing him. He's calling him filthy names. And then it's over. It stops. I was covered in blood. I went to the bathroom and I absolutely vomited. Edward Evans was a teenager who met Ian and Myra at Central Station. He was also taken back to their home, reportedly for gay sex. The thing that helped catch these killers was Ian's request for Myra to collect David Smith, Myra's brother-in-law. David liked Ian's right-wing views and the two couples spent a lot of time together. When David arrived, Edward was murdered in a very brutal way. Edward was bigger and more of a struggle for Brady. David was requested round so that Brady could recruit him to help him with murder. But Ian had miscalculated David big time. David, terrified for his life, helped wrap up Edward's body and drag him upstairs to lock in a bedroom, presumably to dispose of him the next day in the moors. He helped clean up the house of blood and body tissue and then helped wrap up the body so that he would not end up another victim of murder. The second he got back home, he told Maureen, Myra's sister, exactly what happened. They would wait a few hours to go to a phone box with a large carving knife for protection and then report the murder to police, helping unravel Ian and Myra's sadistic killings. They would stay in the phone box until police arrived out of fear of being attacked. Taking the report seriously, the police sent two dozen officers to Ian and Myra's house due to guns being on the premises. The person who approached the door was a policeman disguised as a bread man selling bread. Myra tried to turn him away, claiming she doesn't buy bread from him, to which the police then swarmed in and demanded to search the house for guns. Myra and Ian resisted, but obviously had no choice at this stage. When the body of Edward Evans was found, they were taken into custody. Right away, Ian was arrested, but Myra was freed and allowed to go back home. They didn't believe Myra was involved or that multiple murders happened until David Smith implored them to investigate further. The police would find the planning for the bank robbery discussed previously, along with a ticket for left luggage at a station. When they claimed the suitcase, it contained the tapes and photos of Leslie Ann Downey's last moments on earth. David told police that Ian had joked about burying children on the moors, so the police got to searching for Leslie, not knowing three other victims existed. Ian and Myra would take photos out on the moors, one of which was on top of John Kilbride's shallow grave, which gave police a vital clue. A few days after Ian's arrest, Myra was also arrested. Their dog had been taken into custody too, to establish its age. Timestamps on the photos did not exist, so by looking at how old the dog was, they could figure out when some of the photos were taken. They put Poppet the dog under anesthesia to determine his age, but unfortunately killed him in the process. Myra was then reported to have stormed around the station screaming murderers at the police. At the time of their sentencing, the bodies of Pauline and Keith were not located. Since then, Pauline has been found, but Keith has not. Ian was sentenced to three charges of murder and three life sentences. Myra was sentenced with two charges of murder for Leslie and Edward, but only an accessory to murder charge for John Kilbride. 
meaning she was given two life sentences. A politician known as Lord Longford would try and fight for Myra's release, but ultimately failed and received immense backlash from the public. And a man named Tommy Rattigan has since come out to reveal he was very close to becoming a victim of Myra and Ian, but managed to escape the household. If they were successful, the death toll would be at six known murders. What fascinates me about your story, because you talk about Myra Hindley approaching you, you were seven years old, you were in a playground, mm. and to this day you remember her perfume and her kind eyes. And for me, that, that's what makes it even more um, sinister, is that children trust a woman. When they see a woman, they trust that that woman's going to be kind to them. I think it was always the, the, I mean, for us as children, it was always the emphasis on don't talk to strange men. Yeah. Don't accept sweets from a strange man. You know, and that sort of thing. I think with Myra Hindley, um, she reminded me of my sisters, because I had sisters that were slightly older than me, uh, and the smell of the, the, the hairspray, the perfume, that's the sort of thing that we had yeah. in, in the house, you know, so... Yeah, I, de I definitely remember all that. So you went back to the, the house with her on the promise, as we just her. heard, yeah, of, of bread and jam. Um, even at the age of seven, an instinct kicked in, didn't it? T tell us about what happened in the house that suddenly made you think, I'm in trouble here. Well, I, th the very first thing that she'd done when she brought the slice of bread and jam out, it was the way she actually put it onto the table and it, it wasn't placed on the table, it was basically dropped and pushed so towards me. she went from being kind to instantly being a bit well, sinister. I, well, I, it was her eyes mainly because I looked up at her as she dropped it. I think I was a bit surprised that it was dropped. Mm. I don't know why, you know, it was just... And I looked at her... Well, well actually, my first thought when I looked at the bread and jam, and I, I know it sounds really strange, there was no uh, margarine on it. Oh. <laughs> and I noticed that, you know, mm. and I looked up at her and I just noticed that there was a complete change in her altogether. Mm. Tommy, can I just ask you, really, just what was the house like? Do you remember the house? Oh, was, I mean, was, I, it, was it, what, you know, as a seven year old kid going in, was I, it an ordinary house or? No, it, the, 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 it was a small terraced house. And I can remember, I actually thought at one time that an old woman would more than that, or an old people would come out and speak to me because it didn't match them. Mm. The, the furniture in there was sort of quite old furniture for that time uh, and so but I do remember because I was sitting there for about three or four minutes and I can remember looking around and it, it was just slowly things were starting to where was so Brady? Brady was in the kitchen all the time right uh, he, he and were they talking was she going out of the room and coming back she, in were they talking she, I think she went out about three times and could you hear them talking no I, I could hear something going on and there was just mumbles and, and I wasn't really sort of trying to listen to them anyway. I was just sitting there waiting for this slice of bread and jam. So what was the point then when you thought, right, I need to get out of here, and how am I going to get out of here? He... I heard him. She'd gone back into the kitchen, and I heard him basically raise his voice. It was angry, and he says, effing waste. But he used the full mm, words, you know. Mm. And it was quite angry. And uh, there was another thing as well, is Myra Hindley had a glass of uh, sherry. And it was the sherry, the smell of that, which I absolutely hated because my parents were alcoholics. Right. And that's what they drank. Mm. So know, when you were trying, trying to escape, did they come out of the kitchen? Did they no, see no. you escaping or...? Uh, well, basically what happens, when I decided to go, I went straight for the window. The window was right next to me on the left-hand side. And I just turned the catch and I lifted it and it got stuck. <laughs> and it was stuck to about four inches. And I'm thinking, the first thing I'm thinking is, is my father uh, put wooden blocks on our own windows, mm. and that's as far as it's gonna go. And, and at that time, really and truthfully, I felt so ill. I just wanted to faint. You know, you get yeah, the, that, the oh, panic. Oh, my daughter's seven, I can't the even panic imagine. panic, you know, was just there. And fortunately for me, I just carried on, and it just shot up, and I think that's what made her mm. come out because all I heard then was the little mm. HIT getting away. And did they try and go after you? She did. Uh, I, I actually managed to get out of the window and I felt her, she grabbed the back of my foot. Well, it was the ankle that she got because my momentum just kept me going. And I was... 
as we know now, they, they killed other children. I know. And you say that you f feel guilt about that. Can I you feel so guilty. Explain you that know, to us. Sorry. I, I feel guilty about John Kilbride because it was only... Sorry. <clears throat> it was... It was a week afterwards that John was taken. And sometimes I, I, I just feel guilty and I think if he killed me, perhaps John might have been alive. Oh, yeah. And in some you respects... Like that, though, can you? No, but you in some respects, like then I feel... It's, perhaps it's my fault that John's... No. It's very common no. survivor guilt. Well, have you ever had any sought any help for it? No, 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 not really. I mean, now, you know, I call my, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. I'm, you know, I've got a lovely family, a lovely wife. Uh, lovely I'm a, children. Uh, and beautiful children. And I'm, I'm a survivor mm. for, for, from lots and lots of other things. And I think the book will explain... It's therapy, yeah. Yeah. kind of getting but it you, all out there. You must be very, very overprotective of your own children now as a father. My children never went out on their own. Mm. Uh, I, and I know it's, it's, it's stupid, really, because, you know, all parents tend to wrap the children up in cotton wool. Uh, I think I overdone it. Mm. But having said that, my children actually do that to their own children now. Mm. And I think it's one of those things... There are still two suitcases being safeguarded by Ian Brady's solicitor. The contents of these suitcases could reveal where Keith Bennett's body is buried, or if any other victims are out there. But due to legal troubles, they remain out of access to police. To this day, the body of Keith Bennett remains unfound. His mother Winnie died in 2012, having never succeeded in finding her son. Because of this, Ian always had a strong power over the victims, until the very end. I want to write to him and tell him, before he goes anywhere, if he goes anywhere, to tell me where Keith is. Nobody will forget all about him because it's such a horrendous murder that they've done in the past. Nobody will ever forget him. So it feels like you're still living a life of hell. Because I, I won't settle and I won't give up till I find him. No matter what happens to Brady, but I'd like Brady to turn around and tell me where he is. And then the and then the police and then after that they can do what the bloody hell they want with Brady. Now in the past few minutes it's been confirmed that the Moore's murderer, Ian Brady, has died at the age of 79. He'd been receiving palliative care at Ashworth Hospital, that's a secure psychiatric unit on Merseyside. gets to me most is when Bambury's wandering through the woods and the snow's coming down and he's calling for his mother. You remember? Yeah. When a youngster calls for their mum and their mum don't come, Janet. She said that was out there. Well, I mean, I just struck it, died for a minute. You know, I sat down, I got a bag and I was trying to light it and God knows what. So I thought, I said, what do you mean Heather's out there? You know, and I couldn't think of nothing. I mean Heather, I mean I thought a bloody world of Heather. <laughs> <laughs>